Hello everyone and welcome to the lecture on human aggression and violence. There is a famous quote by Lewis Thomas who said in 1981 that in all of nature there is nothing so threatening to humanity as humanity in itself. If you look at our history books, we know that humans have been violent for a very long time. In the nearly 6,000 years of our history, we've had about 15,000 wars. That makes it about 2.6 wars a year. Nowadays, we fear not only wars, but also things like terrorist attacks that appear to be becoming more and more common. In fact, some groups suggest that humans may be the most vicious animals, for non-survival purposes, that is. More humans die annually as a result of actions of other humans than for any other reason. Now, if you click on the link here, the two links here, you will see how common everyday occurrences can easily es escalate to full-blown fights, even in broad daylight, even in a country that we consider to be as safe as Singapore. In today's lecture, we'll be covering the following areas. First, we will look at how violence and aggression can be defined and the differences between them. Next, we will look at how the development of violence and aggression can be explained in human beings. And finally, we will take a closer look at violent and aggressive behaviours in different contexts. Now, even though we may not realise it, we are exposed to violence and aggressions everywhere. It is prevalent in our everyday lives and we are exposed to it almost on a daily basis. Children too are not spared as they are exposed to it frequently. In fact, many children's shows and cartoons, even something that we all remember such as Tom and Jerry, are actually inherently violent in nature. Many popular movies are no different. Many sports that children and adults either play or watch also contain certain elements of aggression. The degree of how much aggression, of course, varies between sport. sports. Some common examples include rugby, football, hockey, and even netball. Often, the aggressive behaviour is not limited to the actual athletes on the field, but also evident among spectators. Aggression among spectators is mostly verbal, but can sometimes escalate to being quite physical too. If you think back to some of the more famous football matches, and if you look at the videos as to how the crowd is reacting, you will see some elements of aggressive behaviours there. An interesting point to note is that while aggression in these areas of life exposes us to what aggression is about, we often dismiss it as an everyday part of life, as being entertainment or sporting, or part of sporting culture. So if you think about it, there's actually a very thin line between what is acceptable and what is not when it comes to aggressive behaviours. The definition of what is and isn't acceptable is also likely to vary across cultures, as they strongly bound by social norms. Now we know that while there is a lot of violent and aggressive behaviours around us. Not all aggressive behaviours are criminal in nature. And while all violent behaviour is aggressive, not all aggressive behaviour is violent. Let's look at the definition um, of aggression and violence to understand this a little bit better. Aggression is behaviour which causes intentional harm to another person. More specifically, aggression is defined in sequence of behavior in which the goal response is to injure the person towards whom the behavior is directed. Although some definitions emphasize the goal of intention, most psychiatrists agree and most psychologists too agree that it is the actual observable behavior causing the harm that Violence, on the other hand, is defined as behaviour that is perpetrated or attempted with the intention of harming another person physically or psychologically. And the behaviour then is intended to physically destroy an object. So this slide then summarises widely accepted definitions of aggression and violence. Um, at this point, I want to bring to your attention the fact that while aggression may hurt others, as I've mentioned before, not all aggressive behaviors are considered to be crime. For example, a police officer who uses a reasonable level of force on a criminal is exercising aggression, 
but he's not thought to be engaging in criminal behaviours and is considered to be part of his job. Um, another example would be an executionist who is the one who um, pulled the lever to actually hang someone to death. He is involved in killing the person, but his actions are not considered to be a crime because it is part of his legal job. One thing that most researchers do agree on They do, however, differ in the opinions of the people who are in the or whether aggression is learned behavior. Now, this brings us back to a major discipline which is covered in architecture. Why does it matter in the concept of psychology, does it, you may ask, something is nature or influenced by nature or something is influenced by culture? Now, it does matter because it's important to reflect here. Um, whether we view something or uh, we are to get genetic or learned affects our approach to not just understanding these behaviors but also to dealing with these behaviors and the consequences. For example, if we see the behaviors as genetic, then um, they're not changeable. This gives us a rather pessimistic view of crime because if it is biological, Nature, we cannot eradicate it. We can only try to manage these behaviours, keep these innate tendencies in check. Society then also needs to be designed to discourage the display of these instinctive behaviours. On the other hand, if we believe that these behaviours are learned, then it means they can also be unlearned. If it is learned, um, engaging in crime is not inevitable. And if we know how people acquire these behaviours, we can manipulate the societal factors to help them unlearn these behaviours as, as well. Now, when understanding aggression, it's important to keep in mind that there are different types of aggression. Aggression could be active in nature or passive in nature. As um, even within the categories of active and passive aggression, we can further categorize them to direct aggression or indirect aggression. If you look at this slide, it actually gives you some examples of what active direct aggression is, what active indirect aggression is, similarly what passive direct aggression is and what passive indirect aggression is. Um, as a rule of thumb, we can say that while if aggression may hurt another person, it's usually not considered to be a criminal act. Aggressive behaviour can also be categorised as being either overt or covert in nature. One easy way to distinguish between the two is that overt aggression usually involves direct contact or the administration of physical harm. It usually decreases the case, as does most other violent behaviours. The emotions involved in actions are usually Involve high levels of and involve high levels of arousal and anger. Usually these acts are a result of an impulsive individual who will let the social conditions required to address the problem non aggressively. These behaviors usually start early in life and are particularly evident in boys. Covert aggression, on the other hand, is more likely to be sneaky and it usually involves more concealed or dishonest behavior. Unlike overt aggression, such acts are likely to increase with age as people realise that they are less likely to be caught or sanctioned or punished for these acts. These acts are usually less intense and are not a result of an emotional reaction. Instead, they are more likely to have been thought through and premeditated. Examples of covert crimes include fraud. Unlike overt aggression, which relies on strength, covert aggression requires a certain level of cognitive ability so the individual is able to plan his actions. They usually also involve the use of strategy to ensure that the perpetrator himself is not punished or herself is not punished. A third way to view aggression is um, either hostile aggression or instrumental aggression. The main distinguishing factors between these two types 
for the version is um, determined by looking at the goals or rewards and actions of the perpetrator. Hostile aggression usually occurs as a response to anger in these situations. Um, for example, real or even perceived insults or threats. It is often characterized by intense or disorganized anger and usually involves the use of force. The goal of hostile aggression is usually to harm the victim or make the victim suffer, and males are usually associated with hostile aggression. Instrumental aggression, on the other hand, does not usually plan to use violence. That is, harm is not intended unless it interferes with the perpetrator reaching his or her goal. It can be seen as a response to competition or a very strong desire for a particular object, regardless of its cost. Objects in this sense could refer to money, power, or even status. The goal involved in instrumental aggression is usually personal gain. And as mentioned earlier, the goal is not to harm the individual unless there is interference. Females are usually associated with instrumental aggression. Now, most of the time, both types of aggression do not occur in isolation, as acts of aggression usually have multiple motives and therefore have a combination of both hostile and instrumental aggression. Um, so, in summary, the type of aggression the, that is utilized is usually defined by the goals of the aggressor who is committing the crime. When it comes to the law, the law doesn't actually distinguish between the two types as they are both considered to be wrong within the eyes of the law. One case that can help us distinguish between hostile and instrumental aggression is the case of Tyson versus Holyfield. In 1997, Tyson and Holyfield were the two biggest fighters in the boxing arena. In a shocking incident, Mike Tyson bit off Evander Holyfield's ear inside the ring and spat it on the canvas in the boxing ring. It was the kind of performance that outside the ring could be construed as a parole violation. When questioned, Tyson was defiant in the face of disgrace, saying that the bites were in response to Holyfield's hit bites, one of which was ruled accidental in the second round, but did cause a nasty cut over Tyson's right eye. At a later date, in an interview with Oprah, Tyson said he wanted to desperately beat Holyfield in the match, and he bit his ear off because he was so angry that he couldn't beat him. And so he just wanted to hurt him in any way he could. This is an example of how aggression or an aggressive act can be both hostile and instrumental at the same time. In the next section, we will explore some of the psychological theories that help to explain violence and aggression in our everyday lives. From a psychodynamic perspective, Freud believed that human aggression is an instinctive drive and one that is related to the person and not the situation, and therefore an unavoidable part of human life. He believed that all humans possess two basic drives from birth that contribute to personality development and behavior. That is, the drive for aggression, thanatos, and the drive for pleasure, eros. Thanatos is also known as the destructive energy force and it expresses itself in aggression to others as well as self-destructive behaviors. Moreover, these two primitive forces, life and death instincts, seek constant expression and satisfaction while at the same time opposing one another in our subconscious. This conflict is the origin of all aggression. The hydraulic model of aggression suggests that aggressive forces build up like water in a dam and these forces have to be released they spill over into aggressive behavior unless they're dissipated before they reach dangerous levels. Let's see the hydraulic model. Thus, according to this theory, one can never ever eliminate aggression, but can only try to control it by channeling it into ways involving symbolic gratification. This indirect gratification results in catharsis or the release of drive energy, and a failure to do so does lead to aggressive behavior. He proposed that catharsis can be accomplished through actual behaviours, for example, by playing football, or vicariously, for example, by watching someone play football. 
um, they propose, or Freudians propose, that children who participate or avidly watch, who participate in or avidly watch sports will ultimately be less aggressive than children who don't. By extension, what they're saying is, those who, is that those who engage in violent crime often do so because they do not have enough opportunities to blow off steam. Therefore, Freudian suggests that humans must be given multiple and appropriate channels for catharsis to control violent crime. Within the field of evolutionary psychology, um, it's a sub-area called ethology, which is the study of animal behaviours to understand behaviours that are a product of evolution. Ethology, in summary, is the scientific and objective study of animal behaviour, usually with focus on a behaviour under, usually focusing on how behaviours evolved in natural conditions. And these behaviours are viewed as as evolutionary adaptive traits, which is why they've continued over time. This branch of psychology suggests that aggression is not pathological, but is instead a normal behaviour, especially for males, as it allows them to protect their territory and what is important to them. It also suggests that aggression is indeed an inherited and even important instinct as it helps us meet our needs um, to protect our territory to protect our young and ensure that we have the best mates. Evolutionary psychology goes on to say that most species practice ritualized aggression as it is indeed a species preserving behavior. Ritualized aggression usually involves complicated displays of force or superiority, for example, barring the teeth and size or color array in animals. Animals demonstrate their superiority to others to defend their territory through these ritualized behaviors. Evolutionary psychologists also suggest that humans have moved beyond that and often practice aggression to hurt or even annihilate each other. This makes humans one of the few species that practice aggressive behaviors to such an intense level and at a level that does not serve any evolutionary function. Other theories, suggest, other theorists suggest that while this may be an interesting explanation, it hasn't been supported by human aggression research. These researchers suggest instead that humans differ from other animals as our brain structure differs quite significantly from even our closest animal relatives. And unlike other animals, human beings have few genetically programmed behaviours. Therefore, we are more likely to behave based on the situational demands of the environment that we are in. We've looked at the frustration aggression hypothesis in previous lectures. Thus, I will only summarize it here to say that individuals are likely to resort to aggressive behaviors when they feel that their ability to reach an anticipated goal is blocked in some way. Do also click on the link here to watch the short video to see how um, frustration could affect behavior in real life. Cognitive theorists believe that aggression is learned behavior, it is not innate. They emphasize the mental processes such as perception and thoughts, along with the role of learning in situations and the situation in understanding aggressive behaviours. The cognitive neuroassociation model is then a reformulation of the frustration-aggression hypothesis focusing on cognitive factors. Leonard Berkowitz, one of the pioneers of this theory, suggests that the idea of priming, according to which violent thoughts and memories can increase the potential for aggression, even without imitating or learnt behaviour. It focuses on the emotional and cognitive processes that underlie the first frustration aggression link and on reducing the emphasis of aggressive cues. In one study, he showed how in the, in one study he showed indivi how individuals who were shown pictures of guns were more willing to punish another person than those who were shown neutral objects. This theory suggests that negative influences 
produced by disagreeable occurrences, which may be physical or psychological in nature, encourages various thoughts, expressive motor reactions, memories, and physiological reactions linked with both the fight and flight trends. These relations, as a result, enhance basic feelings of anger in the fight response or feeling or basic or enhance basic feelings of fear in the flight response. The aversive events producing negative effects could include frustration, provocation, loud noises, even uncomfortable temperatures or unpleasant odors. At the earlier stages, cognitive processes have little influence beyond immediate appraisal. And this explains why some people may act quickly and based on impulses. Take, for example, a teenager who's frustrated with school and vandalizes the school bus as a result of this frustration. At the later stages, however, cognitive appraisal plays a bigger role to mediate emotional reactions, and this results in more controlled actions. This theory clarifies that aversive events amplify aggressive tendencies to negative effect. It can be stated that this model is particularly suited to explain hostile aggression, but the same priming and spreading activation processes are also relevant to other forms of aggressive behaviours. This based aggression theory basically says that sometimes people are the targets of violent or aggressive behaviours because they were at the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, someone is likely to displace aggression when he or she cannot aggress against the actual source of provocation, but instead takes it out on an innocent party who's mildly annoying. For example, a parent who feels that he's been treated unfairly by his boss at work, but cannot aggress against the boss, uh, comes home frustrated and angry, and gets excessively angry when his child accidentally spills milk on the sofa instead. In earlier lectures, we have discussed at great length how social learning can influence the development of criminal or deviant behaviours. In the next few slides, in the next few slides, we will, build, we will build on this knowledge and focus on how these behaviours or how these theories can be applied to the development of aggressive tendencies. As with deviant behaviours, aggressive behaviours can be learned either through direct experience or by observing others' behaviours and their consequences of their actions. These observable behaviours include how to harm others, which groups are appropriate targets, who can I target and get away with and not get in trouble for, for example, as a consequence of prejudice or discrimination, what actions justify retaliation in an aggressive way, as well as in what situation is aggression um, permitted or approved of. Albert Bandura, one of the leading theorists from the social learning perspective, identified three major types of models when it comes to the development of deviant behaviour. They are family, members of subcultures, as well as symbolic models that are accessible through the mass media. He suggests that family members, especially parents, are very powerful role models, especially up till early adolescence. At this stage, they start playing a less important role and peers instead start playing a more important role. Unsurprisingly, levels of aggression are highest in groups where aggressive models are easily accessible and violence is valued. Since parents are important role models, it is not surprising that aggressive or antisocial parents tend to produce similar offspring. offspring. Similarly, physical punishment from parents was found to be related to aggressive behaviours even in preschoolers. The mass media, which includes the TV, the internet and print media, provides many symbolic models as well. This is especially true in today's society where, ch where children are exposed to these forms of media from a very early age. Behaviour is likely to be imitated if the motivation to repeat the behaviour is strong. For example, a mass murderer may get an idea from a descriptive account from the descriptive accounts of another killing. He may think about the incident 
and it may feature prominently in his mind long after it's been forgotten by others. He continues to think about the crime and reads the scenario mentally until an appropriate condition presents itself for him to repeat the behavior. Um, a behavior is also likely to be imitated if a model is rewarded for the behavior. However, if the model is punished for the behavior, it is unlikely to be repeated. Now, finally, if aggressive behavior is to be maintained, it does require periodic reinforcement, often through the process of instrumental learning. That is, if aggressive behavior brings rewards, it is likely to be imitated and continued. Cultures of honor are cultures where people avoid intentionally offending others and maintain a reputation for not accepting what is considered to be improper conduct by others. Within these cultures, there are often strong norms that indicate either directly or indirectly that aggressive behaviours are not just acceptable, but also the appropriate response when one's honour is insulted. As a result, there are also social norms within these societies that indicate what responses are appropriate to insults, insults or perceived insults to one's honour. Within these cultures, sexual jealousy is also more likely to result in violent or aggressive behaviours. Do click on the link to watch this video that depicts how the culture of honour theory helps to explain differences in reactions in North and South America. The video is not fully in English, but it does have subtitles and it does explain how and why cultural factors may influence the development of aggressive behaviours. According to, the cognitive scripts mod according to the cognitive scripts model, aggressive behaviours are controlled by cognitive scripts which are learnt and memorised through daily experiences. These scripts may be learned either directly or indirectly. These scripts suggest what events are likely to happen, how the person should behave and the likely consequences of their actions. The scripts are unique to the individual but once established, it becomes quite resistant to change and is likely to follow the person to adulthood, especially if it is practiced from time to time. The individual's evaluation of the appropriateness of a particular script determines which scripts are, straw, which, which scripts are stored, retrieved and utilised. Emotions also play a role in the selection of scripts, for example, an angry person is more likely to choose a hostile script than a happy person. Another theory based on the hostile attribution model proposes that those who are prone to violence are more likely to interpret ambiguous actions as being hostile and threatening. Therefore, when you infer an act was committed with hostile intent, you're more likely to react with hostility. This suggests that, for example, aggressive and violent youth are more likely to have hostile attribution biases and therefore are more likely to interpret events in a For example, if he or she has a hostile attribution bias, is someone without the hostile attribution bias. Research indicates preschool years and seems to be stable throughout adulthood. There is, also, there is also a significant relationship between experiencing fear, rejection, maltreatment and abuse as a child and the development of hostile education bias. This is not surprising as those who have been subject to these or this kind of treatment are more likely to become hypervigilant hyper towards hostile social cues and are therefore very ready to see facility in other behaviors. Thus, 
their hostile actions, which may result in them persistently breaking the law, could be their coping mechanism to cope with and master the hostile environment that they perceive themselves to be living within. Another theory that has been proposed is the General Aggression Model. The General Aggression Model, or GAM, is a social cognitive model that includes situational, individual, and biological factors that interact to produce a variety of cognitive, emotional, physiological, and behavioral outcomes. It involves four main factors the individual's perception of the environment, such as explained by the hostile attribution bias, as well as their interpretation of the environment. So if they perceive and interpret the environment to be hostile or aggressive, they are more likely to react violently. If they expect their violent behaviours or aggressive behaviours to be rewarded, they are also more likely to react violently as compared to if they think their violent or aggressive behaviours will be punished or sanctioned. Um, their knowledge of others and their belief of others which is to their perception of others also influences whether they are likely to engage in violent behaviour or not. Due to the general aggression model, um, the event could be a serious event or it could be a benign event. When, and when the triggering event is seen to be as aggressive or insulting, the individual group may want to retaliate against the perception of unjust behaviour. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes these behaviours are very benign in nature. For example, a group of youth may get angry with another group for what they think of as staring incidences. Um, the general aggression model also proposes that violence sometimes could be a result of the deprivation of resources required to meet basic needs. These basic needs may be psychological, emotional, physical or social in nature. And very often um, when engaging in aggression, the general aggression model proposes that individuals dehumanize the potential human targets so that they don't feel so bad, they don't empathize so much. And this in turn then intensifies the violence as empathy levels are reduced. And then the final section, we'll look at how violence and aggression um, plays out in, or pans out in real life. Now we know there are many different forms of bullying. Um, more traditionally, bullying is viewed as being physical, social or verbal. Nowadays, there is a rise in the incidences of cyberbullying, which may be a result of the increase in, which is obviously a result of the increase in internet penetration. Um, but what we do need to know is that the consequences of cyberbullying may be as serious or in fact even more serious than the consequences of face-to-face -face bullying. Watch the video by clicking on the link here to see how cyberbullying resulted in one teenager attempting suicide. It's sad, but unfortunately such incidences are only becoming more common. Bullying is defined as a pattern of behaviour in which one individual is chosen as the target of repeated aggression by one or more others. Some people are pure bullies. Some people are pure, that is that they only do the bullying. Some people are pure victims, that is they are only bullied. And some people are bully victims where they may be the bull bullies in one situation and the victim in another. For example, victims of child abuse are often bullies themselves in the school playground. Um, usually, bullies are motivated by um, the idea of having power over others, um, by wanting to associate with a group that is considered to be powerful and therefore they join in the bullying activities or as a coping mechanism to counter their own negative feelings associated with decision and feelings of helplessness. Um, when they bully and have power over others, they feel that they have some control over some aspects of their lives and this encourages them to continue with bullying behaviours.
Extreme bullying is um, fortunately not as common and doesn't happen as often, but it does have a much higher impact on the victim when it does happen. If you read this article here, you see the life case of two girls who tortured a 14 year old girl, their peer, over a period of 17 hours just because they thought it would be the right thing to do. Aggression also sometimes occurs in the workplace and workplace aggression is defined as any form of behaviour through which the individual seeks to harm others in their workplace. Workplace aggression tends to be covert as overt aggression at work is often not sanctioned. Um, some of the major types of aggression at work include the abuse of supervisory powers, expressions of host hostility against someone, obstructionism such as interfering with important activities of the person, which um, for example could result in them not getting a promotion or in them getting fired, and very rarely overt aggression, which may include things like physical assault and theft. Now, why does workplace aggression happen? Um, it could happen as a result of perceived unfairness, where somebody feels that they've been deprived and they need to aggress. Um, it could also be a result of norms that are accepting of personal violence, or as a coping mechanism or a defense mechanism to deal with workplace changes such as downsizing, layoffs, or changes in the work environment where there is an increase in part-time employees and decrease in full-time employees. The final type of aggressive behaviour, aggressive, aggressive crime, aggressive crime. And crimes are basically defined as violent acts that are directed towards a particular person or members of a particular group merely because the targets share certain racial, ethnic, religious or gender characteristics. Hate crimes can be divided into thrill-seeking hate crimes, reactive hate crimes, mission-based hate crimes or retaliatory hate crimes.